the course of 11 days in May of 1941, the beautiful Greek island of Crete was the scene of a fascinating battle between its allied defenders and the German invaders. Taking place relatively early in the war, both sides were clearly still adapting to the new dynamic form of warfare that would come to characterize the Second World War. However, the most interesting aspect of this battle might be that it provided a prime example of snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. Today we will analyze this fascinating but in many ways tragic battle in more detail. Why would the Germans even want to capture Crete? Now, this is a fair question, especially since the invasion took place only a month before the German invasion of the Soviet Union. While it could be argued that the island had a significant strategic value due to its central location in the eastern Mediterranean, it certainly cannot have been a top priority for the Germans. In all honesty, it is pretty likely that Germany was simply in a winning mood being seemingly invincible after overrunning most of the Balkans, namely Yugoslavia and Greece, in the weeks prior. German generals regarded Crete as an excellent opportunity to use their new superweapon once more, the Fallschirmjäger, or paratroopers. So far they had been incredibly successful in the invasion of the Netherlands and Belgium, and they had also played a part in the invasion of Norway. Also, capturing an island by air would be a nice first. Hitler eventually agreed, but only on the condition that the activities on Crete would not interfere with Operation Barbarossa. While the Germans were optimistic about their chances, the Allies were even more confident. And rightly so. The Germans were planning a surprise attack, but thanks to the efforts of the excellent Polish and British decoders, Allied command had managed to intercept the Luftwaffe's Enigma-encrypted radio messages and communication in the weeks leading up to the attack. The Allied commander in Crete, General Bernard Freiburg, had been receiving strictly confidential reports about the imminent German attack from early May and was asked to organize his defenses accordingly, although he was not allowed to share the information with any of his staff members. From German communications, it also became clear that they were severely underestimating the Allied military presence on the island. While they assumed that around 10,000 poorly trained troops were present, the real number of Cree force troops approached 40,000 and included many well-trained ANZAC units, soldiers from Australia and New Zealand. The Allies were setting a trap and Germany was about to walk right into it. A decisive German defeat would also show that German troops were not invincible, dealing the Germans a massive morale blow in the process. The German plans were quite simple, really. On the early morning of the 20th of May, 12,000 German paratroopers would be dropped in two attack waves. The first wave would target the airfield of Malem and the harbour of Suda Bay, close to Tkania. The second wave would arrive later, targeting the minor airfields of Heraklion and Rethymnon. After these strategic points were captured by the German paras, an additional force of 10,000 soldiers would be sent to the island, preferably by ship. Although this was all known to Freiburg, his interpretation was different. Since he was not allowed to discuss the plans with his staff, this would prove to be problematic. Freiburg was an experienced commander, having commanded troops in the First World War. Although experience is important for a commander when combined with stubbornness, it can lead to reluctancy to properly adapt to a new situation. Freiburg failed to understand that the initial German assault would be fully airborne and expected the real invasion to come from the sea until it was far too late. This caused him to hold units in reserve that could have proven essential in the fighting that was to come. What makes this worse is that Germany did not even have the naval presence or landing vessels in the Mediterranean to pull this off and that the Royal Navy guaranteed to stop any naval invasion force. Right, so as the first German attack wave arrived on the 20th of May, Freiburg was having breakfast near Kania. As the gliders came down and the parachutes unfolded in the sky, he coolly remarked, they're dead on time. I mean, they were Germans after all. While the Germans expected to cause total surprise and possibly even panic among the Allied troops, instead they mostly landed in a duck chute. Many paratroopers were shot at while still in the air or immediately dealt with after coming down. 
Due to the German habit of dropping weapon containers separately, paras that managed to land safely could only return fire properly after locating one of the containers. After the first day of fighting, things looked terrible and even hopeless for the Germans. The first wave of attack landed in a relatively organized manner but faced heavy resistance and was mostly forced to dig in away from their targets. Due to the unexpectedly large loss of aircraft during the first wave, the second wave was delayed by hours and reduced in size. 600 paratroopers were forcibly left behind on the Greek mainland. By the time they finally landed, they barely stood a chance. 80% losses within units on the first day were no exception, and none of the units even got close to reaching their goals. Yet the battle was far from over. The Germans realized that even capturing one of the initial strategic targets could provide them with enough of a foothold to stand a fighting chance and bring reinforcements. As things stood after day one, the Germans only had one tiny slither of hope. Although several small isolated pockets of Germans had landed unopposed, there was one battle group that posed a real strategic threat to the Allies. Major Walter Koch and his force of several hundred paratroopers landed in gliders just west of Malim, in an area that was mistakenly left unguarded. When moving up to the airfield, they quickly encountered several of the four New Zealand companies under the command of Colonel Leslie Andrew. These were assigned to defend the airfield. The Germans proved to be tough and managed to cut the New Zealanders' telephone lines. The cutting of telephone lines was rather problematic since the companies at the front line were not equipped with radio transmitters, effectively muting them. After being unable to contact several of his companies for hours, Andrew incorrectly feared that they had been overrun. This, combined with the increasing number of mortar rounds raining down on his headquarters, caused him to ask his superior, Brigadier James Hargest, for reinforcements, but his request was denied. To alleviate the German pressure on this position, Andrew organized a counterattack using the two Matilda tanks that were at his disposal. The sudden appearance of tanks caught the Germans off guard, since they did not have any anti-tank weapons. However, their fears soon subsided as one of the tanks suffered from a malfunctioning turret, while the other managed to get itself stuck in a dry riverbed. Not really a great show for the Allied powers. With the tanks rendered useless, the counterattack soon lost steam. Andrew, now considering himself out of options, requested permission to retreat if he did not get reinforced. Although Harges did promise to Andrew two additional companies, he clearly did not grasp the gravity of the situation. Instead of urging Andrew to hold his crucial position, he told him, If you must, you must. When the promised reinforcements hadn't arrived by nightfall, Andrew decided to retreat. In doing so, he not only abandoned his headquarters, but also ceded the crucially located Hill 107 to the Germans. From this hill, the entire airfield could be shelled. As such, the runway became useless. Later that night, the two companies that were presumed to have been overrun learned of Andrew's retreat by chance. Realizing that they were now essentially abandoned, they saw no other option. Than to retreat as well. This meant that by daybreak all Allied soldiers had evacuated the airport. The next morning both the airport and Hill 107 were taken by Koch's highly surprised troops without firing a single shot. After learning of the capture of Malim airfield the German command in Athens realized that not all was lost. To test whether the airport could be used safely they had sent Clay on a solo flight to find out. Clay, who was known to be somewhat of a daredevil, immediately agreed to this dangerous mission. Upon his safe return, the German command, led by General Kurt Student, decided to go all in and seize the final opportunity to avert defeat. Firstly, they immediately sent in the 600 paratroopers who had been left behind the day before. Meanwhile, they also started sending the reserve troops, one aircraft at a time, creating a permanent stream of Junkers flying in and out. Although the New Zealanders attempted to disrupt this German operation with blind artillery fire, a real counterattack was not organized. This allowed the Germans to strengthen their position, and by the end of the second day, they numbered around 2,000. While this was significantly more than 12 hours before, a strong Allied counterattack during the night could still end any German hopes of a victory.
A counterattack was eventually organized, but it was massively delayed and much too insignificant. Kyberg and Harges still clearly did not fully grasp the gravity of the situation. The counterattack only consisted of two battalions numbering around 1600 troops and thereby roughly equaling German numbers. Although the counterattack reached the edge of the airport, it was eventually repelled by the freshly arrived German troops. To emphasize how badly the Allied command understood what was going on, after the counterattack, Hargest reported back to HQ that the steady stream of German transport aircraft probably meant that they were evacuating. The Allied commander's reluctance to fully commit to the counterattack can partly be explained by the fact that they were still expecting the real invasion to arrive overseas at any moment. Keeping an eye out to the sea proved not to be completely unwise. Spurred on by the relative successes of the second day, the Germans sent out two small flotillas filled with supplies and additional reinforcements. These were, however, quickly dealt with by the Royal Navy. Despite the victory at sea, the Allied situation was about to get worse. Not only had Freiburg kept nearly 6,000 troops in reserve to defend the coastline, but after the invasion from sea was dealt with, he now assumed the battle to be won and went to sleep. He didn't realize that the Germans were anything but beaten until the next afternoon. By then, the Germans had firmly established themselves on the island. Freiburg had three fresh battalions at his disposal, together with the troops already engaged around the airfield. It is probable that the airfield could still have been retaken. But that wasn't what happened. Instead, Freiburg decided to retreat to more easily defensible positions, not wanting to take the gamble. This allowed the Germans to freely send in reinforcements and supplies, while their numbers also kept swelling due to the previously scattered paratroopers slipping back behind friendly lines. Their offensive soon became unstoppable. Six days after the German landings, Freiburg radioed back to Cairo that Crete could not be held. Most of Cree force could be evacuated from the southern side of the island, but several thousand troops were forced to surrender to the Germans. A small minority of Allied soldiers fled into the mountains and joined the local resistance. Against all odds, the German had managed to win the Battle of Crete, despite being outnumbered and only lightly armed. Nevertheless, for the Germans, the battle was a mixed experience. Despite attaining a decisive victory in the end, losses were as high as 6,500 casualties. In hindsight, students' invasion plans were judged to be too reckless and ambitious. The battle had shown the terrible vulnerability of paratroopers if they were improperly used. Partly because of this, Hitler decided that Germany's paratroopers were only to be used as elite infantry from then on. Nevertheless, the Allies were impressed by the paratroopers' capabilities and started training programs of their own. While they had learned some valuable lessons, the morale blow on the Allied side was massive. Their losses amounted to over 20,000 and they had blown their opportunity to disprove the myth of German invincibility. Worries about an airborne invasion also grew significantly in Great Britain itself. For the Cretans, the unexpected Allied defeat was especially tragic. Not only did the island now face four years of brutally enforced occupation, but it also led to the deportation of the island's Jewish population. Thank you for watching this video. Now, if you'd like to know how Allied paratroopers operated, consider checking out the video about Operation Biting and the Bruneval Raid. Both are in the World War II playlist on screen right now. I would also like to thank all my patrons for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider checking me out on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you will already get access to the exclusive Patreon series. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.